بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى today we will finish the battles of the reign of Umar bin al-Khattab because uh, I feel that we have been going too much into the history and uh, kind of been sidetracked about what we were supposed to be doing which is Umar bin al-Khattab at the same time I realized that this is the one and only time that we're going to be going over these conquests and so I thought that we should spend some time on it. Nonetheless, and I do give the disclaimer, and I've given it many times, that this is not a history class. This is the class about Umar bin Khattab. But because these incidents took place in his Khilafah, really we have to kind of, it is essential to at least go over it to a certain level. And in the end of the day, those that are interested should go beyond this series. Now today we will finish up. So we talked about the conquest of uh, Sham, Syria. We talked about the conquest of North Africa, uh, Egypt. And yesterday, or last week, we started talking about the conquest of the Sassanid Empire. Today we will finish the Sassanid Empire. And that, that is basically the primary conquest of Umar bin Khattab. And next week we'll move on to other issues about Umar bin Khattab. So today we'll finish off what we had begun. And who can remind me what did we do last week? Where are the note sky takers? What did we do last week? We did Qadisiyah, and we talked about the next major battle which is going to be the conquest of which city? Today was what? We, we said that last week. The capital. The capital. And the capital is called? Madain in Arabic, Tesiphon in English. Okay, Tesiphon in English. Madain. Now, Tesiphon was the capital city of the ancient Parthian and the Sassanid Empire. So it was the capital of Persian glory for over 800 years, from 250 BC to 650 CE, when the Muslims conquered it. So imagine you are going to conquer the capital of the Persian Empire that has been the most glorious and magnificent city. In fact, when the Muslims conquered uh, Tesiphon, Tesiphon was the largest and the most populated city in the entire world at the time. It is not something that is a trivial matter. They are going to conquer the city that is now the, 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 the most prestigious city of the entire world. And Tesiphon today, uh, as I mentioned last week, it is around 35 kilometers south of Baghdad. And to this day, if you go to that region, uh, you can still see the remnants of the palace of Kisra, uh, and of the emperors, and it is called Taqi Kisra. Taqi Kisra. It is still there to this day, and it is the largest man made freestanding vault constructed in human history. It's a massive vault that goes more than 100 feet, 110 feet high, and it is a massive vault that has no other structure supporting it. So for that time and era, to not have something supporting it, and it's so big, obviously it seems very magnificent. And in fact, it is one of the wonders, if you like, of the ancient world. And of course, that exact same structure has been standing for over 1,500 years. So imagine, that structure even predates the Prophet ﷺ. And we still, it is still present to this day. That very structure under which the Roman emperors basically uh, uh, extended, not the Roman, the Persian emperors, extended their audiences, they sat in their thrones, that very Taqi Kisra is still there to this day. And um, because the city was so old, it is literally over a thousand years old, 800 of which it is the capital. Because it is so old, in fact, what had happened was that it was composed of many smaller settlements, each one of which had fortifications. And then there was a major fortification around the entire city. And that is why the Arabs call it Al-Mada'in, which is the plural of Medina, the many cities, Al-Mada'in. It was the many small cities, because it is the largest city. Imagine something like New York, something, it's not just one city, is it, right? You got Queens, you got Manhattan. Similarly, you can imagine that such a large congregation of people, it wasn't just one place, it was many smaller places, and each one of them have their encampment. And so, after the victory at Qadisiyah, Umar ibn al-Khattab, uh, realized that he needed to ma march on to Tesiphon, to Madain. So he commanded Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas to basically uh, go and move on to the capital, uh, Tesiphon, because with the conquest of the capital, then the rest of the empire can be considered to be won over. Obviously, you're going to capture the capital. It's a huge symbolic victory. And in fact, it will be very difficult for the Sassanids to regain after that. And that is exactly what happened. That after... 
after Qadisiyah was the great battle of Madain, Tesiphon, and then there is one more battle we will do today, and that is basically the end of the Sassanid Empire. So the army began to march towards Tesiphon. On the way, they conquered many of the other smaller cities. They conquered Babylon. Babylon is, of course, everybody has heard of Babylon. It is the most ancient civilization known to man. There is no civilization that predates the civilization of Babylon, Babel. And of Allah mentions in the Quran as well, Bibabi la Haruta wa Marut. That Babylon, they conquered it. And then they moved on to another city called Al Kusa. And Al Kusa was a great symbolic victory for the Muslims because Al Kusa was the area or the region or the land where the Emperor Nimrud had attempted to kill the Prophet Ibrahim. The fire that had been built had been built at Al Kusa. And to this day, they say, I have never been there, they say that they know exactly the place. Allah knows best, but they say the place is still known to this day. The place where the fire was built and Ibrahim alayhi salam was attempted to be killed. We all know the story. This took place at Al Qusa. So the Muslims conquered this land as well. And slowly but surely, they kept on moving on until they made it to the river Tigris. And the river Tigris is where the capital was located. Tesiphon was located on the banks of the river, river Tigris. Of course, the river Tigris is one of the two major rivers of the region. What is the other river? Euphrates, right? So Euphrates and Tigris are the two major rivers of that region. And Tesiphon sits on uh, the, the river Tigris. So when they made it to the river Tigris, on the other side of this massive river, that is where they could see Tesiphon. And most likely, they reached the walls of Tesiphon, January 637 CE. Now, the city, of course, had great fortifications. It had many catapults. It had many other uh, weapons, you know, those things that they, not just catapults, but similar things to catapults. They call them what ballistics, other things of this nature. Basically, things that can trampoline off. They can throw heavy objects or throw fire or throw oil and, and, and gas or throw small sharp objects uh, far distances. And the Muslims obviously by now are not the Muslims that have left Arabia. They have learned much in the last few years. And they also have plenty of Persians who have converted over to Islam in their army. And they also have non-Persian, non-Muslim Persian converts, sorry, non-Muslim Persians who haven't converted, but they have converted politically, not religiously. Because in every civilization, there will always be people who don't like the current rulers, who don't like the leaders, and they're willing to side even with the enemies if it is against their leaders. Dare I remind you, in certain segments of the Republican Party, let's say, their hatred of the current administration is so much. Wallahi, we understand. They're more than happy to go side with people they would have hated before this. We understand that hatred. We see it now. So, it's not surprising in those days the same. There were people who hated the royal family so much, they're more than happy to cooperate with the Muslims against the royal family. And that is exactly what the Muslims did. They took advantage of all of these people that are now joining their ranks. And... Therefore, the Muslims as well have plenty of equipment and new tactics. And they also have locals who will inform them of the layout of the land. And most importantly, they have one amongst them whom they can trust with their life and limb. They can trust completely. And he is yet one of them. And that is Salman al-Farisi. Salman al-Farisi was a part of the conquests of Persia. And Salman al-Farisi, even though was too old to physically fight, he is now, we don't know his age, you know, they say he died when he was 200 years old, Allah knows best, but clearly he is definitely, definitely at least 80, 90 years old, bare minimum. No matter what, how you want to permutate that, he's got to be at least 80, 90 years old. For our era, 80, 90 is a lot. For their era, 80, 90 was almost unheard of. So Salman al-Farsi is now a part of the um, army. And even though he himself was too old to physically fight, Salman al-Farsi played a primary role as an interpreter, as a negotiator, as a diplomat. And um, uh, while unfortunately we don't really know too many of the details because the books of history are sparse, it is very clear that Salman al-Farsi a lot, had a lot to do with the brains behind what's going on. 
and we can only imagine the tactics he would have used, the conversations that took place. We can only imagine that he would have been able to convince many of his fellow Persians. In the end of the day, he is one of them. Ethnically, he's one of them. Language-wise, he's one of them. Looks-wise, he's one of them. And yet, he is of the greatest of the Sahaba. And so Salman al-Farsi must have played an amazing role. Unfortunately, the books of history, as with many things, are simply sparse on this uh, regard. But just imagine the effectiveness of uh, who he is and his background. So they get to the walls of Tesiphon, Madain, and they decide that they have no option after they're bombarded with catapults and whatnot than just to lay siege to the city just to lay siege to the city. And so in January of 637, they surrounded the city to cut off its supplies and to basically wait it out because in the end of the day, they need food. The people in the city need food. And even though they had water, because the water is flowing, still you need meat, you need supplies, you need barley, you need grain, and the people of the city cannot grow their own food, can they? And so the Muslims decided to basically, uh, basically cut it out. Uh, cut off the supplies of the city and the days turn into weeks the weeks turn into months at least two months they're waiting it out and there are sparse battles here and there but the uh, the major there's no major battle in fact it is mentioned there was one of the battles and again small battles nothing major took place the Tesiphon conquest will mention over and over again uh, took place without a major battle it was a siege but there were many battles. You know what always happens. Every few days some people are going to come out, some contingents are going to come out. And in one of these it is reported, one of the more interesting stories that one of the early battles the uh, Sassanid uh, contingent came out and at its head was a trained lion. A lion that was used in battle. And this obviously was a tactic that was working because the horses were basically uh, bolted when they saw the lion, uh, the Muslims as well, you, you really can't battle a lion in the, in the battlefield, can you? So they had this ferocious lion, and it is said that one of the Muslims by the name of Hisham ibn Utbah uh, finally uh, managed to basically rush towards the lion with his sword, charge directly onto the lion, and then basically dealt it the death blow. And uh, Hisham ibn uh, Utbah uh, managed to kill the lion. And as a reward, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas in front of all of the other Muslims kissed Hisham on the forehead uh, to reward him and to honor him that, this, uh, that he had killed uh, the lion. In any case, there was no major battle. As we said, minor skirmishes here and there. Soon afterwards, the emperor, Yazdajard was his name, Yazdajard III, but we call him Yazdajard. Yazdajard sent an emissary to the Muslims. And he had an offer. He had a proposition. What is the proposition? You guys have entered our lands and you've conquered all of these lands all the way to the river Tigris. Because they've conquered Kufa, Basra, I mean, not Kufa and Basra, but the cities that are now Kufa and Basra, were the land that was occupied by the Sassanids. You've conquered Al-Hira, you've conquered all of these major cities. Let's call it a deal. You keep what is on the other side of the Tigris, and we will be on this side. Now, what does this demonstrate? Weakness. Weakness. The same army, the same peoples that had mocked the Muslims barely a year and a half ago, what are you guys doing here? Go back to your lands and we'll forget this ever took place. The same people are now saying, okay, you know what, you can keep 30% of our land, just don't worry about it. Just We'll call it a day here. Let's call it a truce. Don't fight us, and we'll let you keep, and we won't fight you back. Now, obviously, do you think the Muslims are going to accept? Obviously not. They've come so far, so close, and so uh, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas refused, and he said, Ya imma al-jizya, ya imma al-qatil, that either you pay the jizya, because he knew they wouldn't convert, uh, or we will uh, fight. And so, obviously, they refused the jizya, and so they insisted on remaining in the siege. They insisted on remaining inside the city. Now, of course, in the meanwhile, as the months drag into, as the weeks drag into months, the city begins to be deplete, depleted of its resources and its people. And the richer people basically leave. And this is the reality that happens. SubhanAllah, may Allah protect our brothers and sisters. What's happening in Syria? What's happening whenever any type of war happens? What happens? The people that are able to get out. No matter how they can, they get out. And so even as this is raging, 
the city of Tesiphon begins to lose people by the hundreds and the thousands. And the noblemen and the rich and the warriors, they defect, they just move our... And so the city becomes smaller and smaller. And it is said that even a stage was reached where the people were so depleted of their resources that they had to start eating cats and dogs inside the city. This greatest city that was the jewel of the world, the most advanced civilization, the largest city in the world at the time, is now suffering a calamity the likes of which they have never seen since its founding. And... Eventually, as the siege get, goes on and on, some of the new Persian converts tell Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas that, look, if you march so many miles up the river Tigris, you will actually come across a point which is more narrow. And if you go at this particular time of the month when the tides go up and down, you might be able to cross over it. In other words, basically, I'll tell you of a way that you can go across the river to get to the other side. Because where they were, the river was too big and too deep. And that was the advantage that the capital, the Tesiphon had. And that's why they built the capital there. So Sa'ad hears of or he learns of one of the, 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 the converts from their site. And again, this shows us, subhanAllah, Allah blesses Muslims from ways they will never expect. Who would have, what Muslim would have known this? How would they ever have figured out? But Allah Azza wa Jal guided one of them. We don't even know his name. These are all now lost in the books of history. But Certain people must, who must have been very well known, very well connected, they genuinely embrace Islam, they flip over to the other side, and now they are helping the Muslims against the people that used to be their own. So Sa'ad hears of this particular place, and he sends 600 uh, riders to cross over, and of course even these points are being manned, but by much smaller groups. So the 600 Muslims do manage to cross over and the small group of Persians that are stationed there are overpowered and killed. This rouses up the, the uh, spirit of the Muslims. And so they all march up towards that area and they begin to cross over by the tens and thousands. And when the people of Tesiphon hear that the Muslims are on our side of the river, they pack their bags and flee. They pack their bags and flee, and including Yazdajad. Yazdajad himself had already sent his own wives and children to other cities, and he himself was in the capital. When he heard the Muslims had crossed over half a day away, it wasn't obviously immediately there, it was up north. They had to go march, march a little bit and then come back down. When he heard they're on our side, even he packs his bags and flees. And so who's going to remain in the city once the emperor has left? And so... The Muslims arrived and found a city that was essentially abandoned by maybe 80% of the population. Hardly any army was left. Hardly any uh, resistance was there. And the remainder of the people, however many they were, 10, 20%, we don't know. They were rounded up and brought in front of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. And they agreed to pay the jizya. And so they were allowed to uh, remain uh, in. They were allowed to remain uh, in the uh, city. And it was at this point in time that Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas basically enters the palace. And by the way, the palace was called not the White House, but the White Palace. It's called the White Palace. And that is because, mashallah, I can see why, mashallah. That is because it was white marble. Okay, you forgot to mention the marble. It was the white color. And it was beautiful palace, mashallah. And as I said, still remnants of this day uh, stand. And so he entered the white palace and he converted its massive hall, which was the splendor of the palace. He converted that into the masjid where the Muslim army would pray, where Jumu'ah would be given, where salah would be basically led until after a few months, the actual masjid was built. Obviously the proper masjid, that palace became the masjid. Now, uh, to be honest, words fail me in attempting to describe even my own emotions as to try to visualize that scene. I mean, I don't even know what to say. Even if you think about what's going on, if you try to understand the realities, just imagine the most beautiful palace in the world the most powerful center of political authority in the entire world, the oldest capital of the world again, 
the center of the Persian civilization, the grandest pavilion that thousands of ambassadors from across the various civilizations were entertained by the Persian emperor. Imagine, if you like, the, the pillars. Imagine the chandeliers. Imagine the, the fountains. Imagine all of this wealth. And who enters? Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. The same Sahabi who was one of the earliest converts to Islam. Who was tortured and persecuted from the earliest batches. Who participated in the hijrah. Who was of the most gallant warriors of Badr. Who was amongst the elite who was defending the Prophet in the battle of Uhud. So much so that the Prophet said, Irmiya Sa'd fidaka abi wa ummi. This is that Sa'd. When he is throwing his spear, his bow and arrow in front of the Prophet protecting the Prophet at Uhud. Wallahi, the mind just boggles. My tongue becomes silent. I don't know how to even describe my own emotions. That Sa'ad just walks in without a fight. And the keys of the greatest palace in the world are his for the taking. And that magnificent pavilion that Allah knows had witnessed how much grandeur, splendor, drunkenness, fahisha. Now what is happening in that very palace? That very room, the adhan is being called. Jumu'ah is being given. The five daily salawat. And that very sahabi whom uh, the Prophet promised Jannah. Because Sa'ad is one of the ten. Sa'ad is one of the ten. That very sahabi, even though he's promised Jannah, he is already sitting literally on the throne of Khusro Parvis. Literally the throne. Of course, the current emperor is Yazdajad, but Khusro was the one who made the grandeur. The palace was before Khusro's time, but it is known as Khusro's palace. This is the same Khusro that the Prophet wrote the letter to. That's where he was. And Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas is now in that very room, on that very chair. Honestly, just imagine that civilization now. And this is so symbolic of the conquest of Islam. This really summarizes how quickly, from where to where. This is the same Sa'ad. He is worried for his life in Mecca. And now he is on the throne of the Kisra of the Sassanid Empire. Wallahi, what other civilization can we say this happened? So quick, so fast, and zero corruption. This is the beauty that only Islam can claim. The heart of Sa'ad is the same Sa'ad that was the Sa'ad of 40, 50 years ago. That heart is not craving the wealth and the power and the seat of Kisra. No, not at all. It is the same heart that was there at Badr and at Uhud and at Khandaq and at the death of the Prophet ﷺ and all through. And now Allah Azza wa Jal is blessing him and through him the Muslim Ummah. And honestly, this is so symbolic of what is taking place during this early time of Islam. And I think for me personally, this imagining this scene is one of the most amazing scenes of early Islam. One of the Ashara Mubashara, one of the earliest converts, is now in charge of literally the palace of Kisra. And of course, who do you think he's going? Sa'ad's going to go on. He has to conquer other cities. He has to leave a governor. Who is the most logical choice to be the governor of the capital of the Sassanid Empire? Salman al-Farisi. And another amazing snapshot. Subhanallah. Salman al-Farisi, from where to where? From where to where? Wallahi, again, one of those just bizarre, we shouldn't call it ironies, it's qadr. But still, it is ironic from our perspective. It is the beautiful irony. It is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who is Salman al-Farisi? He was the one who was tortured as a young child, sold into slavery. Remember the story. He was deceived and sold into slavery. Why? Because he wanted to meet Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He left his land because he loved a person he hadn't even seen, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He left his people and his civilization because he wanted to meet the one whom Allah had promised to send. And how does Allah bless him? How does Allah reward him? 50 years later, he comes back 80, 90 years old and he is now given the governorship of the very civilization he left.
the capital is now his and he remains as the governor until he dies in the time of Uthman ibn Affan. Salman al-Farisi, wallahi, just one of those amazing snapshots again of from where to where. This is how Allah rewards. He gave up his people for the sake of Allah. Allah gave him all of his civilization back and said, Yalla, this is yours because you gave it up. So again, one of those amazing snapshots of Islam as well. And of course, by the conquering of the capital, uh, Tessifon, it was after these conquests that of course, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas sends all of the booty and the goods to uh, of Khusro because again even though Yazdajard is the emperor so Khusro's personal items are in this very pa palace obviously right the very clothes that Khusro used to wear you know in every society the king's uh, goods are kept even to this day you go to England you find all of the kings and queens their jewelry you go to Scandinavia Norway their jewelry and whatnot for thousands of years you still see it so this was the palace where Khusro's belongings were kept and so Umar ibn al-Khattab received massive amounts of gold and silver and, and jewelry and wealth, untold wealth. And this was perhaps the largest ghanima that Umar's time had ever seen with the conquest of Madain. Because obviously this is the capital. How much can Yazdajar take when he flees? He, took, he takes whatever he can. The rest is all left in the treasury. And Islamic Sharia says that. Every uh, battle, one fifth of it will go to the uh, the Baytul Mal. Okay, this is the Sharia of Islam. Four fifths is distributed to the people who are fighting, and one fifth of it is sent to the Baytul Mal. And so, Saad ibn Abi Waqqas calculates how much, and the best of the best, and especially Khusro's uh, personal effects and his sword and his bracelets as we know in the story and everything that is when he sends it to Umar ibn al-Khattab and Umar ibn al-Khattab he came into the masjid when the treasures had arrived and the entire masjid is just full up until the, the height of men it is full of all of these treasures and trinkets and, and jewelry and Umar ibn al-Khattab said any group that is as trustworthy in returning this amount to me is certainly a trustworthy group. Meaning, how can anybody be so trustworthy that this amount is coming without any armed guards? Nobody's forcing anybody. There's no security station. What a civilization that was. This is what Amana brings. Any group that can send this to me is truly a trustworthy group. That this amount literally is beyond what anyone has ever seen. And this was when the famous incident took place that Umar sat on the mimbar and he looked at this huge pile of wealth and he went around it and he picked up those personal items of uh, Kisra and he then called uh, uh, Suraqa ibn Malik and he put on not just the bracelets by the way, he put on the cloak and he put on the crown and he put on the, uh, the, bra the everything of Kisra and of course the prophecy was fulfilled. And then he said that, O oh Allah, you deprived the Prophet Sallallahu of all of this wealth and he was better than me and more beloved to you than I am. And you deprived Abu Bakr of this wealth and he was better than me and more beloved to you but you have given it to me. So I seek refuge in you that you have given it to me in order to tempt me. I seek refuge, you know this is a temptation for me. I seek refuge in you. And he began to cry so much that the sobs overtook him until those around him began to feel pity for him. And he commanded Abdurrahman ibn Auf to distribute this entire wealth to the mustahiqin and the muhtajin to give it to those who needed it. And therefore, before even the sun fell, these, in our equivalent, tens of millions of dollars were given all to what is needed because the empire is being run. So Sa'd, uh, not Sa'd ibn Ibn Abdurrahman Abdur ibn Auf is one of now the ministers and he knows who needs to go where and he distributes it and every city and every land that needs this is given uh, to them. Uh, so this was the conquest of Madain and as I said, it is very symbolic that Madain was conquered without an actual battle. The greatest city in the world without an actual battle. And this was a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise, truly, it is amazing. Now, the final battle that we will discuss. So I want every one of you to know the three major battles that you should know or the three major incidents in the conquest of Persia. Of course, there are many, many more smaller battles. There are three major ones. The beginning, this, and the end. 
The beginning is Qadisiyah. Then the, cap, the capture of Tesiphon, the siege of Tesiphon. It's called Fathul Madain, the conquest of Madain. And then the third big battle, and that is Nahawand, the battle of Nahawand. Okay? These are the three battles that every Muslim should be familiar with. These were the biggest and most important milestones. As for Madain, it was simply a symbolic milestone because it's the capital. There was no actual battle that took place. As for Qadisiyah, we discussed it. As for Nahawan, we'll very quickly go over it. That the Battle of Nahawan was fought in the year 642 CE. And so this is basically one year uh, after, uh, sorry, a few years after uh, Madain is, is captured. The Battle of Nahawan is fought in uh, 21 AH. And the Battle of Nahawan is in Arabic is called Fath al-Futuh. Fath al-Futuh. The conquest of all conquests. And by the very title, you understand how important this is. Fath al-Futuh, the conquest of all conquests. Why? Because this was the battle that Yazdajard managed to gather all of the remnants of his army and to la launch the final major offensive. After this battle, which we all know we won, there was no major battle to this level at all. That's why it is called Fath al-Futuh. It is the conquest of conquests. This was the final big battle between tens of thousands or maybe even a hundred thousand or some say 150,000 on one side. That's the Persian side and the Muslim side. Again, these numbers are difficult to come by, but Tabari says 30,000, 40,000 on the Muslim side. In, uh, so typical 1 to 4 or 1 to 5 ratio. That is standard in these, in these um, uh, battles. And it takes place in the land that is called Nahawand. In the land that is called Nahawand. And the emperor Yazdajad, as I said, had managed to regroup. A few years have gone by since Madain. He's been traveling the other provinces, getting together armies to go, come and recapture his capital and to finally get rid of the Muslims. And so Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas writes a letter to Umar al-Khattab begging for reinforcements and asking for advice. And he is telling Umar that uh, Yazdajad is on the march and he has gathered together the largest army that we have ever seen. And we need every single person in order to fight. And so he writes this letter to Umar ibn Khattab. And Umar ibn Khattab, uh, it so happened that another incident was taking place at the exact same time. And that is a Nu'man ibn Muqrin, one of the leaders of the uh, Bedouins and one of the Sahaba of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And a Nu'man is indirectly praised in the Quran in Surah Tawbah when Allah says, وَمِنَ الْأَعْرَابِ مَنْ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ There are some of the Bedouins who believe in Allah and the last day. So remember there are verses that criticize the Bedouins. That the Bedouins are the most hypocritical. Most of them are hypocrites. The Bedouins are... But Allah says, but there are some Bedouins that are love Allah and His Messenger. And they believe in the last day. And Allah will reward them and forgive them and cause them to enter Jannah. And it is said that uh, and Nu'man ibn Muqrin was one of them. There are even a hadith that Mukhtalafi that the Prophet said, This is Nu'man is one of them. In any case, Nu'man is a respected Sahabi for sure. And so Nu'man ibn Muqrin was placed as the governor of one of the new cities. One of the new cities. And he's a Bedouin. And Bedouins don't like cities. Bedouins don't like Hadara and, 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 and being a part of a, you know, just a sedentary lifestyle. And additionally, there was plenty of wealth now and plenty of, of basically opportunities. And an numan wrote a letter to Umar ibn Khattab and he said that, O oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, my example is that of a young man who has a beautiful perfumed prostitute enticing him. I beg you in the name of Allah to... Relieve me from my duties and send me back to the battlefield. What's he saying? I don't want power. I don't want to be the Amir. I want the battle. Get me out of this politics and send me to where I want to be, and that is the battlefield. So when he got this letter, so Umar said, Nu'man ibn Muqrin will be in charge of Nahawand. You will be the battle 
the leader of the army. So it just, and again, Qadr Allah, that this is coming and this is coming. And so he answered Nu'man's request and Nu'man was sent to be the leader of Nahawand. And Umar ibn al-Khattab as well wrote to many other major companions and governors. And he commanded quite a number of the companions to go and participate in Nahawand. And so we have some of the most famous of the Sahaba. Uh, Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman went, uh, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari went, um, his own son, uh, Umar's son, the most famous son, who is Abdullah ibn Umar went. And other famous Sahaba, they all went from various cities and lands, from Basra and Kufa, from Medina, from Mecca, from the newly conquered territories. Groups and groups are being sent. Umar ibn Khattab is sending them. And you know, when I was reading all of these, Wallahi, the thing that is coming to mind is, how can Umar ibn Khattab micromanage so meticulously? How can he take care of so many things simultaneously? But that is what he is doing. That he is being conscious of who is where, who is doing what, and he knows who to put in charge of what issue. And he knows how many troops to request from every garrison and from every city. And all of this without keeping track and record. This is all in his mind. Truly an amazing, an amazing persona. So he wrote to all of these Sahaba and he wrote to every city to send so and so and so and so until finally around perhaps 30,000 people gather uh, towards the, uh, the land, the city of Nahawand. Now, the Persians were the ones who had chosen the city. They knew exactly where they wanted to fight. By the way, Nahawand is still standing to this day. The city Nahawand is one of the most ancient cities of Iran. It is still a very beautiful, very, uh, very well-known city. And of course, Nahawand is also known, by the way, for its uh, um, um, maqam. They have uh, music and poetry, and they have a, a rhythm, Nahawand. And so one of the famous rhythms called maqamat is called maqam al-Nahawand. And it is a very beautiful one. And some of the famous Qur'an that all of you like to listen to, they recite in a maqam that is called Nahawand. It is called Nahawand after the same city because the city was an area of civilization. And they were known for their, their reci not recitation, their, their, their um, melody. Um, what do you call the musical tones? Whatever it is, I don't know the musical terms. You know the, the musical, there's a s scales, what? notes whatever there's a certain there's a certain pattern that is how you recite arabic poetry and the people of nahawand had a certain rhythm or pattern and they were known for this and that is why there is a maqam called maqam al nahawand and it's well known and when we had the qari uh, two or three ramadans ago he recited sometimes in nahawand uh, he said this is what he liked in any case so this is the same city of nahawand why did they choose nahawand because Nahawand was the most heavily fortified city that had not yet been conquered. It had massive walls, few feet thick. And most significantly, it had a huge moat dug around the city. Now why was this? Because Nahawand was a fortress city. It was used in the ancient Persian times. I mean, from the time of uh, Xerxes, who is like one of the most ancient Parthian uh, kings. So he used this as one of the cities to fight against the Romans and the Turks from. So this was a fortress garrison city and it was heavily protected. And the Persians or the Sassanids knew that we need to now basically get rid of the Muslims once and for all. So they had stocked the city with plenty of supplies because they realized from the battle of Tessiphon that sieges, the Muslims have a lot of patience and they will remain and eke it out. And so they stocked the city with supplies to last them for at least a year. And the city is known for not just its walls and its moats, its catapults as well. Again, it is a city that was used historically in many battles from the time of the Parthians. And it was used also by Khusro as well for a major battle in his time. And so Nahawand was chosen by uh, Yazdajad to basically intentionally be the final battleground. And the... Muslims uh, attempted, once they got to the city, to make some headway. But again, you cannot fight against uh, a walled fortress that has a moat, that has catapults. They, <coughs> they really could not do much. And once again, they decided to wait in a siege. But this did not work this time because supplies were plenty. Supplies were plenty. And... Uh, the Muslims were getting a little bit frustrated what exactly can be done. And here it appears that they resorted to a tactic. 
And we know that al-harbu khid'ah, or as the famous Chinese military tactician Sun Tzu said, deception is... <laughs> Sun Tzu didn't say that. That's a, that's a, that's a hadith. <laughs> deception is what, nine-tenths? Deception is nine tenths of the battle, something like that. Sun Tzu has the, you know, Sun Tzu is the famous military general of the Chinese, uh, and he has the Art of War, which is considered the classic manual of of uh, ancient times. Uh, and one of the rules in it is basically deception or deceiving your enemies nine tenths. And our Prophet said the hadith that uh, you quoted, Al Harbu Khid'a. And when did he say this? For what circumstance? Remind me. Remind me. We covered this in detail. So which battle? Ahzab, exactly. Ahzab. So uh, it, it appears that the Muslims resorted to another uh, khid'a, which is of course halal at this particular point in time. And the details are a bit vague, but it appears that uh, one of the main people who thought of this was Tulayha al-Asadi. And Tulayha al-Asadi was... Who is Tulayha? Hmm? No, 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 no. No, no, no. Tulayh al-Asadi was one of the false claimants to prophethood. We talked about him in the time of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. And he was the only one who publicly repented and who was forgiven because of circumstances we mentioned. He claimed to be a prophet, one of the false claimants, right, to, to be a prophet. And then... In the time of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, uh, he publicly repented before he was captured and he re-accepted Islam. And uh, he became a good Muslim. And in this battle and in a number of battles in the conquest of Persia, he demonstrated his iman over and over again. So that is why he is considered uh, a noble, uh, basically, uh, Muslim because he showed his sincerity uh, in this regard. So the tactic, by the way, is really not mentioned that explicitly. There's a lot of controversy what exactly it was, but it appears, one theory appears, that the, the rumor was spread that Umar had died, and the Muslims had, were appearing to panic and pack their bags and leave. So the books are vague, and that is why we don't know too much, but whatever it was to trick 30,000 people, sorry, 150 are on the other side, to trick 150,000 people and to coordinate a plot amongst 30,000 truly is a feat of art. But that's in essence what happened. That whatever was the ruse, there seemed to be this mass departure of the Muslims and the Persians were convinced that Umar had died and they decided to go out and attack the remaining Muslims because now there was only a small group there. And of course, this was the ruse. These remaining Muslims appeared to flee in panic and more and more Sassanids came out until finally they all are racing behind. And of course, there's a lot of loss of life amongst the Muslims. This was a very, very bloody battle because it was a decoy. And whoever is in the decoy, you know what's going to happen to them. Okay, so it was a very brave stand, very courageous, and it was also just truly an amazing tactician's basically feat that took place here. And the Muslims continued to basically pretend to flee until they reached an area that was pre-planned, and that is where tens of thousands of Muslims had already been stationed behind the scenes, unaware to the Persians. So when the Persians came, then the Muslims came out. It was basically a trap, and it worked. Hook, line, and sinker, the Persians fell for it. And it is said that over 20 or 30,000 Persians lost their lives. Imagine, 20, 30,000, the victory was stupendous. So, Fath al-Futuh, Nahawan, it's also called, turned out to be the greatest victory. Qadisiya was great because it was the first, because it was such a miracle. Nahawand was great because of sheer quantity, because of the victory, because of the quantity of the Persians that had been killed. And after this, 
Yazdajarud was never ever able to summon that type of force ever again. Yes, there were smaller skirmishes for the next decade or so, but less than a decade, but never could 150,000, never could his primary generals. After this, it was as if their backbone snapped into two. And they could never muster. They lost their capital. A few years later, this Fatah al-Futuh takes place. And that is that. The end, really, of Sassanid glory. As for An-Nu'man, uh, the leader, An-Nu'man made a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right before charging at the end of the, the trap. He was leading the trap. Right before charging. And he said, Oh Allah, I ask you that today you give me my shahada and today you give the Muslims the biggest victory for Islam and the Muslims. Give it today. I want you to accept my soul and have my soul be witness to the biggest victory for Islam and the Muslims. And indeed, he uh, was wounded on the battlefield severely and he passed away on the battlefield, but at the end of the battle. And he heard of the good news as he's bleeding to death on the battlefield. He hears that the Muslims have won. And the last thing that he says is, go tell Umar that, uh, that Allah has given us victory. Go tell Umar al-Khattab that Allah has given us victory. And he appointed on his, not even deathbed, he's on the battlefield, whatever you want to call it. In his la he appoints Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman to take charge after this. And so Hudayfa basically becomes the next uh, leader uh, of the army. And other battles take place after this, but none of them even come close to Nahawand. And the Muslims began conquering many of the smaller cities and provinces one after the other. And each time there is a fight, but here now the table has turned. The Muslims have 15, 20, 30,000, and the Persians are all scattered in their various cities. And so Hamadan and Jurjan and Khorasan in 22 Hijra, Array in 23 Hijra, another army is sent to Azerbaijan, which is finished in the time of Uthman, but it begins in the time of uh, Umar in 22 Hijra. Uh, by the way, so uh, for us of our blood in this audience, <coughs> Umar ibn Khattab also sends the first Muslim army to India, to uh, Makran, to Sindh, basically, right? And the interesting story takes place here that uh, he actually, the, the, uh, the, army is under the command of Al-Hakam ibn Amr and Al-Hakam ibn Amr fights one of the local uh, lords the Hindu Rajputs over there and actually wins some military victories and he makes it to the Indus River he makes it to the Indus River but he sends an envoy back to Umar al-Khattab and this envoy it is said his name was Suhar Suhar and uh, when this envoy entered uh, to the presence of Umar, Umar al-Khattab asked him, what is this land of India? What is this land of, that you have conquered of Makran? Tell me about it. And so Suhar responded, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ardun sahluha jabal, wa ma'uha washal, wa tamruha daqal, wa aduwuha batal, wa khayruha qalil, wa sharruha tawil, wa al-kathiru biha qalil, wa al-qalil biha uh, uh, in other words, he gave some very dense rap, dense poetry. And so Umar bin Khattab said, are you a poet or are you a messenger? What are you? Now this translates as, O Amir al-Mu'mineen, this is a land, Sahluha Jabal. Its flat land is mountainous. Okay. وَمَاءُهَا washal. Its water is dark and muddy. وَتَمْرُهَا دَقَلْ Its tamr is basically the worst, like very, very, there's no dates. The tamr is very dates. وَعَدُوُّهَا بَطَلْ And the enemies that were fighting are warriors. وَخَيْرُهَا قَلِيل Very little khair, right? وَشَرُّهَا طَوِيل Okay, the evil is very big in it, okay? Um, and even this وَالْقَلِيلُ بِهَا ضَائِعِ And even the, the good that in it is, is very lost and not and scattered. And what is beyond what we have conquered is even worse than what we have conquered. Okay? And so Umar said, if that is the case, then stop and come back. Forget about it. And so Pakistan had to wait 1,300 something years. That was a joke. The point being, Umar called back the army and it was only the time of Uthman that another army was sent that too was called back and then in the time of Muawiyah a third was sent 
and that kind of established a somewhat permanent base. And then eventually there was the land of Multan. Uh, and and um, um, subhanAllah, I know this. Uh, which one? No, no, that, that, Muhammad al Qasim, yes, but what's the other city called? There's two cities that were established still in Pakistan, the remnants are still there. Which one? No, 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 no. I, I know this, I wrote a whole paper on it. I know I sent this before when I mentioned it. No, there was two cities, yeah, th that was also one of the earlier cities, but not. So there were two very ancient cities, and the remnants, by the way, are still around to this day. I'll have to look it up myself. But the remnants are still around to this day. The remnants of those original cities. And they're still in Pakistan, in Sindh province to this day. And they are archaeological sites, not in Karachi. Or not Karachi. Okay. Uh, close to it. These are close to it. They, these are cities in Sindh. And to this day, there's lands are there. And I, and I wrote a paper, the Habbada dynasty. I remember the paper I wrote. The Habbada dynasty was established over there. And I mentioned that. Uh, that this is anyway that was a different story the point is Umar ibn Khattab got to India what is now Pakistan he got to that region of Sindh uh, but they decided to come back and then Uthman again and then uh, Muawiyah as well uh, in any case so let's finish up our uh, Sassanid um, and this is the final as we said the final class about military conquest of Umar ibn Khattab next week we'll continue other things about Umar ibn Khattab and maybe even finish um, and move on to Uthman after that we'll see inshallah but no more military about Umar ibn Khattab uh, so the conquest of the Sassanid Empire continued for another decade or so. And finally, uh, in December of 651 CE, during the first or second year of the reign of Uthman ibn Affan, the emperor Yazdajard was eventually killed. And with his death, the rule of the Sassanid Empire came to an end. Over 750 years of Sassanid rule, and before that, over 600 years of Parthian rule, and so over a millennia of Persian glory came to an end because of the Sahabat al-Kiram, because of the Khulafa al-Rashidun. And as I said over and over again, this military conquest truly represents the pinnacle of Islamic conquest. The, the Khulafa did a lot against the Byzantines, but they didn't eliminate them. As for the Sassanids, they eliminated them. And they couldn't eliminate, eliminate the Byzantines because our Prophet said that. Our Prophet said that Heraclius honored my letter, Allah will give his kingdom some honor for a while. And Khusro tore my letter up, Allah will tear his kingdom up like he tore my letter up. So they couldn't eliminate the, the Byzantines, but they indeed eliminated the uh, Persian uh, em uh, Empire. And by the way, the, uh, the story of the death of Yazdajard is also one of those absolutely amazing twists of human history, one of those tragedies. Well, it's a, not a tragedy, meaning we're happy at it, but still, nonetheless, at some level, it's a tragedy from where to where, that uh, Yazdajard, uh, after the defeat after the defeat of Nahawand, he kept on going from one province to another, trying to fight the Muslims over and over again for the next, so Nahawand takes place 642, he dies in 651. So for the next nine years, Yazdajard is going from village to village, town to town, and he does put up maybe at least six or seven other smaller battles until finally he keeps on having to flee more further eastward, inland, away from Tessiphon, and he ventures into smaller areas with smaller armies and entourages until more and more of his own people abandon him. And eventually he is entering the final frontiers of his kingdom with only a handful of men. And the only power that he has is the name of him and his father. That's it. He has no other power, no army, no wealth. And he barges in thinking that these mini governors are going to kiss his hand and feet. But subhanAllah, this is Qadar Allah. This shows you how much power these people have. That 10 years ago, if Yazdajad had given them even some attention, they would have jumped up for joy. Now Yazdajad comes into their palaces and they couldn't care less about him. None of them helped him. Some of them outright refused and said, get out, we, we have nothing to do with you. These are the same people, the same Iranian Persians that swore him loyalty, 
right? But now the tables are turning. And who is Yazd Dajjal? And what power does Yazd Dajjal have? All of this, this, this illusion of power that people have, wallahi, is just because of the temporary. It's not coming from the heart. And this is the difference between Islam and between every other system. The respect that we give to our Prophet it comes from the heart. The izzah that the Sahaba gave to, and the Muslims gave to the Sahaba, it comes from the heart. And as for Yazd and the glory that he had, it was just because he had an iron fist. And when the iron fist fell, all of his glory fell with it. So this guy who is the emperor of Rome is now begging for handouts. Literally, give me some money, give me some uh, army. And one governor after another. And even as he's traveling, more and more of his entourage abandons him. Until finally, to make a long story short, so the final city that he goes into, the governor rudely tells him to get out. Literally tells him to leave. I'm not going to help you at all. And he is abandoned completely by everybody. So he has to disguise himself as a common man for fear that somebody might harm him. And he wears the garment and the cloaks of the common folk. And he enters the city of Maru, which is a famous Iranian city to this day. He enters the city of Maru as a complete stranger, anonymous person. And he's begging for food and shelter. And he finds a, uh, a, a miller, somebody who's basically grinding and, and miller. And this miller was also basically a thug, an evil person. And the miller befriended him, said, I'll take care of you. Don't worry, come and sleep at my place and, and you can be a guest. And he has no clue who the person is. And he kills Yazdajard in his own house. So a commoner who grinds grain kills the emperor of Persia. And he only discovers he was the emperor when he opens his bag and belongings and finds the crown and finds the stamp and finds all of the possessions of the governor. Subhanallah. These are lessons. Wallahi inna fi dhalika la ayah. That these are ayatul lil mu'tabirin. These are signs for those who think and reflect. Where was Yazdajad and what was his end and fate? And he dies an anonymous, unknown, majhul nakira, completely unknown amongst his own people. And one of his own lowly folks is the one who eventually ends up killing him. And of course, with his death, Khalas, the emperor of the, or the Sassanid dynasty, comes to a complete um, end. And uh, with that, of course, the smaller provinces. And, and again, our modern historians, we said many times, they point out that there was so much inner politics between the Sassanid Empire. Each one is selfish for its own and not wanting to help others out. And this was a tactic that Allah used to help the Muslims gain uh, victory and command. One final footnote, inshallah ta'ala, and that is that the people of Persia, of course, are Zoroastrians, or they were Zoroastrians. And Zoroaster was their um, alleged prophet. Now, there's a lot of, of speech, of kalam or talk. Was Zoroaster a prophet or not? And in the end of the day, really, it's not our, it doesn't concern us. Whether he was or not, it's definitely not a matter of aqidah. We do not know. From his teachings, I looked into it a few years ago. I, I couldn't sense that much monotheism. But Allah knows best. Allah knows best. And who really, it's nothing to do with us whether he was or not. And whether it, he had an actual true message that was corrupted over time. Or he was just um, a false, basically, prophet. It doesn't really matter to us. But the Zoroastrians had one of the most ancient civilizations and religions. In fact, it is said that the Zoroastrian religion is the most ancient religion still around. Uh, and the people of, of Persia were, of course, Zoroastrians. So the Sahaba, when they conquered uh, Persia, Sassanid lands... One of the first questions they ask Umar ibn al-Khattab, what do we do with these guys? Because they're not Ahli Kitab. They're not Yehud al-Nasara. What do we do with these people? And this was the siyas of Umar al-Khattab, which became ijma'. So all of the madahib agreed to this because Umar gave a fatwa. What was Umar's fatwa? Amiluhum mu'amalata Ahli kitab Treat them like you treat Ahli Kitab. Accept that. You cannot marry their women or eat of their meat. So this is now ijma. All of the madahib agree that the majus, the Arabs called the majus, 
uh, and in, in in English or in, they call them the Magi's. Remember, the three Magi's came the from in the even in the the New Testament the, the to Jesus allegedly, right? They were the Majus, the 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 Majus or the the um, the Zoroastrians. By unanimous consensus of all of the Madahib, they are allowed to pay jizya and live amongst Muslims and practice their laws inside of their own communes and they will be left alone, but they will not be allowed. Muslim men cannot marry their women and their dhaba'ih is not halal for us. This is by unanimous consensus. Now, by the way, interesting point as well. Based on this, the Hanafi madhab said, this should be the case with every other religion as well. And that is why the Hanafi madhab had no problem with pagans and idolaters, i.e. Hindus, living in Muslim lands. Because the Hanafi madhab allows any faith. And the other madhab say, no, only Yehud and Nasara and Majus are allowed. And this is the classic ikhtilaf amongst the madahib. So, uh, so the Hanafis took Umar's fatwa and they said, if Umar ibn al-Khattab extrapolated to the Majus, we can extrapolate it to everybody else. And frankly, honestly, that is a very solid opinion and I'm very sympathetic to it. Okay? It seems to make the most sense that when Umar is saying, treat them like Ahli Kitab, except that you cannot marry and you cannot have of their food. What he is saying is they are allowed to live and they have the same freedoms and they pay the jizya and they can follow their own sharia in their own gatherings. And the Hanafi madhab, in my opinion, has a very strong point that is very, uh, it makes a lot of sense. Um, now, it is true to point out that perhaps the Majus were not treated as nicely as the Yehud and Nasara were. And that probably is because they did have some bizarre rituals and customs that perhaps the Muslims were not that sympathetic to. Okay? So there is a lot of tension between the Majus and the Muslims. This is true to say. And even though maybe the Khulafa didn't instigate it or whatnot, but the Majus, the, the Zoroastrians, they really felt under pressure. And a number of incidents took place, especially in early uh, Islam, where uh, they felt that this is not... The, and especially, also, they had an immense amount of pride because of their civilization, because of their heritage and background. They had an immense amount of pride that they're not going to basically uh, accept. And so what happened was that over the course of the first hundred years or so, a large group of them decided to leave Darul Islam. They decided they don't want to live under the Muslims. And this is unique in that this did not really take place, for example, in Egypt or Sham to that much extent, as much as it took place here. And perhaps the reason, as I said, was maybe this did happen, that the Muslims were not as nice to them as they were to the Ahli Kitab. Okay, and as we said, I mean, they had some really interesting or bizarre, uh, for example, there was common practice that, uh, is, may Allah protect us from these types of things, but uh, incest was very common amongst them. In fact, the, nobil the nobility would especially want marriages to take place, let's just say, within one family. Let's just put it that way, you get the point, okay? Uh, and they felt that this would remain pure blood, for example. Obviously, when you have these types of practices, yeah, and you're going to attract the criticism and the mocking and, and so other things of this nature uh, that obviously their practices are a little bit different uh, from, from those of Ahli Kitab. But Ahli Kitab, the Muslims understood. Ahli Kitab, the Muslims kind of, they could understand what they're doing. And the Majus, and there's a lot of fire involved in this. So it's like they're, they just, there was perhaps too much. Maybe it was, maybe it's true. I'm not defending, I'm not criticizing. Maybe it's true. So a large group decided to leave and they left to uh, Baluchistan and from there to Gujarat. And they settled in Gujarat. And the people of Gujarat call them those from Persia or Parisiyan. Parisiyan. And so they then were called Parisis, which every one of us from our land knows who the Parisis are. So they're called Parisis because they're from Persia. Uh, Parisiyan, those from Persia. And interestingly and ironically, Zoroastrianism dwindled in the land of Zoroaster, Iran, until 
and there was no forced conversion. Again, there was never forced conversion. But what's going to happen, slowly but surely, people continue to convert until uh, in our times there's probably less than 20,000 Zoroastrians left in Iran. Just 20,000 is nothing. It's nothing. In some cities here, we have more Muslims for Eid than entire Zoroastrians of Iran. In Houston, we have more than 20,000 just for Eid. Right? And the largest group of Zoroastrians is where then? Gujarat, India. India, Parsis. Okay, the largest group of Zoroastrians is now actually in India. And they're called Persians, Parsis, because they left under the Muslim rule. And they left probably 750, around 700, 750 CE. They just did not like living under the Muslims, so they left. And so there are probably 70, 80,000 Parsis left. And even that's a small number. So Parsis, by the way, are very dwindling, by the way. This all tangent, not related to Umar al-Khattab, but I know everybody's interested in these types of things. Parsis are very few, very few in number. There's probably around, in the whole world, there's probably less than 150,000. Nothing. They're gone. They used to be millions. Now they're just gone, and they're very, very dwindling. Ironically, there are more Parsis in America than there are in Iran. There are more Parsis in America than in Iran. And in fact, I myself have met two or three converts to Islam who are Parsis. I met two or three converts. In fact, one of my uh, very close students uh, is a Parsi convert as well. Uh, and it's just, I mean, you hear from them the stories and everything about their culture and society. Oh, uh, us Pakistanis should be know Parsis very well because our founder married a Parsi and his daughter converted to Parsism. And his daughter's daughter and son, basically the grandchildren of Qaeda Azam, are Parsis because he married a Parsi. And that's the real. Anyway, I'm going to my tangent. Astaghfirullah. Anyway, back to our topic. So, in any case, what, uh, the, whole, the whole point was what? That Sassanid Persia, after having this magnificent, glorious civilization, came to an end in less than a decade. And for me, this symbolizes the, the, the swiftness and the beauty and the sheer amazing, if you like, uh, conquests of early Islam. How could a group like the Sahaba, how could Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas walk into the very palaces of Kisra and sit on his throne without even shedding one life? Think about that. Wallahi, if this is not a miracle, the largest city in the world, the most advanced city, is handed to one of the Ashara Mubashara. If this is not a gift from Allah, what is? And to me, again, the, my, I don't have words to describe the emotions, the thoughts, the images. This is the reality. And Umar ibn Khattab, with this we conclude, inshallah ta'ala, Umar ibn Khattab wrote a very long letter to Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. I wanted to read all of it, but wallahi, it is too long. It would take at least 20 minutes to give a sharh of it. It's a page and a half. But the gist of the letter is, Allah is going to give you victory through your piety and not through your weapons. Beware of your own sins more than you are aware of the enemy. Because they will hurt you more than the enemy will hurt you. And never think that because you are Muslim and they are not, Allah will give you victory just because of that. Look at the Bani Israel. They were the believers in Allah. And look at the Persians. So the Persians did what they did to the Bani Nebuchadnezzar and the others. They, they did what they did, the massacres that took place uh, and the ancient Babylon, um, the, the reconquest of the temple, of the, sorry, the destruction of the temple and all whatnot. Look at Bani Israel and Allah destroyed them. As Allah says in the Quran, He's going to send people against them. And these were the same people. The Persians were sent against them even though they were the believers in Allah. So the whole letter that Umar ibn al-Khattab sent to Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, and I wish you can read it, and I wanted to do it, but it would really honestly take literally if I were to d d translate it and give a sharh of it, it's an entire khutbah in and of itself. But the gist of it is Allah will give you victory through your iman and taqwa and not through your weapons. And this is the reality of early Islam. It is impossible for a group like the Sahaba to militarily win the Sassanid Empire. Impossible. And yet, Qadisiya, Tasifan, Fatah al-Futuh and Nahawand, and all of these other cities, one after another. Yes, there were some minor setbacks. But in the end, 
in less than a decade, the greatest civilization that mankind had seen for a millennia simply ceased to exist from the face of the earth. And that, to this day, is one of the most amazing, unexpected U-turns of human history that, for us, is a miracle, and for others, is still they are debating it to this day. And uh, one final point uh, for those of you who are interested, I actually have a picture of uh, the Roman Emperor Khosrow Parvez, minted in his very time, a picture of the coinage that he had. As you know, I'm a numismatist, I collect coins, and some of my more expensive or rare coins are the ones right here in front of you. These are actual coins of uh, Khosrow Parvez, Khosrow Aparvez, the actual emperor that the Prophet ﷺ, uh, corresponded with. And afterwards, you can come and look at it. You can actually, um, uh, well, you cannot see it there. You cannot see it there. You can actually see his image carved into the coins. And you can look at it. These are actual, the, the, the real coins there. Silver, yeah. Yes, there's uh, written on it. Uh, so these coins were both uh, basically, they were struck <coughs> in the time of Khusro, uh, Parvez. And the early Muslims, the Khulafa, Rashidun, they did not mint their own money. They did not mint their own money. <clears throat> the Umayyads were the first to mint their own money. So what <clears throat> Uthman ibn Affan legislated was that he would take the money of the Persians and they would just write on one corner, Bismillah, to Islamicize the coin. Okay? To Islamicize the coin, literally. That's what they did. And so both of these coins are actually Uthman ibn Affan's coins from the era of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. Actual coins from the era of Uthman ibn Affan. And uh, these coins were minted by Khusro. And Uthman ibn Affan, basically, uh, in his era, they were taken. And the Muslims basically added some silver and brought Bismillah. So you can clearly see... Uh, you cannot. You cannot see it. You cannot see it. Okay. You can? Who is going to zoom in? Are you going to zoom in? I don't know if you can zoom in. Rusli, I don't know if you can zoom in or not. Okay. Okay. Where my finger is, you can see Bismillah. Right where my finger is. Right above it. And for those of you who want, you can come afterwards and look at it afterwards. Okay. Uh, after the Salah. After the Salah. After the Salah. Where else are we going to? Any okay. I trust every one of you. Like Umar ibn al-Khattab trusted Sa'ad ibn... Well, not that much, but still. <laughs> to a certain extent. I trust all of you, inshallah ta'ala. So these are coins. I actually wanted to get a coin of Yazdajard, uh, but they are much more rare. Why are they much more rare than the coins of Khusro? These are rare. These are obviously rare. But the coins of Yazdajard are even more rare. Why? No, no, not no one wanted it. Huh? Shorter time. Civil war going on. He has to run everywhere, right? He doesn't have time to mint coins, okay? So uh, there are coins of Yazdajad on sale, but a little bit above my budget as of yet. So uh, when any of you wants to give me something, I'll tell you where to buy the coins of Yazdajad, inshallah ta'ala. And um, it depends, it depends. Uh, I mean, and the price is very immensely. Uh, but these ones are, are less than a thousand, these ones, Okay. Uh, I didn't get, so there are ones that are even more expensive than these, obviously. But So it depends which one and the minting and the year. So this one, um, this one that I have over here. Oh, one second. Well, they keep on going up and down in value. This one is in the year 30 Hijrah. And this one is 25 Hijrah. This one is 25 Hijrah. This is one of the earliest coins that I have. One of the earliest coins that I have is this one, 25 Hijrah. My, most of my coins, I specialize in the early Umayyad. So I have hundreds of early Umayyad coins. Uh, I specialize in the Umayyad and also the Umayyads of Andalus. I, I have some of the Umayyads of Andalus as well. Uh, but uh, I also have some of what are called the uh, Arab Sassanid coins. These are the Arab Sassanid coins. I also have, by the way, some pure uh, pre-Islamic uh, Sassanid coins as well. Uh, and those are cheaper because what is really expensive are the Islamic Sassanid coins, which is this one. Okay? This is like five times more expensive. You can get a coin of Khusro, uh, maybe one third or one fourth or one fifth of the price of these ones. 
if it doesn't have Bismillah on it. Because Khusro was, I don't know, 35 years in power, thousands and thousands or tens of thousands of coins. So, but the, these ones with the Bismillah, that's where you get the market, obviously, much more. Because, I mean, I'm not interested in Khusro without. But what I find very interesting, personally, you can actually see Khusro. Again, you cannot see it from there. You can see Khusro on here. He is carved out as an image here. This is Khusro. And yes, the Jard, uh, you can also see him. I don't have it personally, but I know what it looks like. And Yaz Dajard is beardless. Khusro is an old man on this coin. Yaz Dajard is beardless, young, young kid. So it's interesting to see the, the contrast between the two, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, in any case, inshallah, next uh, Wednesday, we will be doing uh, the, uh, uh, maybe the final, we'll see. Uh, I'll see how it goes, but we'll be finishing up Amr al-Khattab. Uh, and then we'll take a bit of a break for the Thanksgiving. And then come back. Uh, so next Wednesday will be the final. And then take a bit of break for Thanksgiving. And then come back, inshallah, for uh, a few more weeks in December. And then I'm going for an Umrah trip. So we're going to have intermittent, inshallah.